to portfolio questions on education. Education and skills. And we start with question number one from Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out of the impact on schools of its proposed reduction to local authority budgets. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government continues to treat local government fairly despite the reductions to the Scottish Government budget from the UK Government. The 2018 19 financial settlement for local government foresees an increase both in revenue and capital investment as part of a wider package of measures. Together with the additional power to increase the council tax, this will generate an increase of 1.6% in the overall resources to support local services. In addition, we are investing £179 million in the next financial year, up £9 million from last year, in raising attainment and closing the attainment gap, targeting funding at schools and local authorities who will benefit the most. This funding contributes to our commitment to provide an extra £750 million for education during the course of this Parliament. This investment in Scottish education has enabled a total of 666 additional teachers to be recruited over the past two years. Ross Greer. Thank you. The Scottish Parliament's own information centre says that the, cut, the real terms cut to council budgets this year under the draft budget will be £157 million. Some of those cuts local authorities have been forced to consider include a £7 million cut from the teaching allocation in South Ayrshire and £2 million by reducing curriculum subject choice and teacher numbers in Falkirk. Is the Cabinet Secretary seriously suggesting that if he was running a council in Scotland today, he would be able to set a budget that did not include any cuts? Cabinet Secretary. I think I, I, I have long experience of looking at the financial proposals that are put forward invariably uh, by council officials to elected members at local authority level. And I've also got just about as much experience of seeing those proposals being rejected by elected members when it comes to setting budgets. And the reason for that is that the latest data shows that education budgets in Scottish local authorities increased by £144 million in 2017-18 a 3% increase on the year before in cash terms. And obviously on top of that, we've allocated the £120 million of pupil equity funding. So clearly there's a lot of discussion still to go on about the budget. There's about to be a debate in relation to some of those issues this afternoon. And the full budget process is yet to take its course. And the government, as the Finance Secretary has made clear, um, will remain actively engaged in dialogue with other parties about how to take forward those budget provisions that were set out to Parliament in December. Claire Adamson. Thank you, pres Presiding Officer. Um, could the Scottish Government give an indication of whether um, funding has risen recently for, um, and what the ratio is for individual pupils, both in the primary and secondary schools? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the uh, spending on education and training in Scotland uh, rose by 4.1% in 2016-17. Um, the average spend per pupil in Scotland has increased in cash terms since 2006-07 by at least 10.8% for primary pupils and 13.1% for secondary pupils. Um, and uh, the total revenue spending on schools has risen since the government came to office uh, by £349 million or 7.6% in cash terms. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary recently said at the Education and Skills Committee that he has concerns about the lower retention rate of experienced teachers, more of whom left the profession in academic year 16-17 than was expected. Clearly, this places additional pressure on other teachers, but it also places budgetary pressures on local authorities to recruit sufficient support staff. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what work is being undertaken by the Scottish Government in cooperation with local authorities to collect the relevant data about numbers of support staff and assess the relevant gaps within schools? Cabinet Secretary. The Government is actively involved with local authorities in relation to um, a, a wide variety of issues on workforce planning, but principally in relation to the number of teachers in the teaching profession. And of course, that work is, is bearing fruit because, as we saw in December, the number of teachers in our schools has increased by 543 as a consequence of the measures that we have taken and by uh, over 800 since I became the Education Secretary. So I welcome very much the increase in the active teaching population within Scotland. It is for individual local authorities to um, decide upon and agree the deployment of staff within individual schools and that will extend much beyond 
the teaching workforce, but uh, we certainly actively collaborate through the teacher workforce planning group with local authorities in relation to the identification of appropriate number of teachers uh, to staff the education of our children. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Monday, the Education and Skills Committee met with teachers in Glasgow and having spoken with ASN teachers and heard their concerns about a range of issues affecting ASN issues, uh, education, and those issues included funding, has the Scottish Government assessed the impact of its budget cuts in previous years and in the coming year on ASN education? The, uh, the, the data speaks for itself. Um, there has been an increase in the number of um, staff working with ASN pupils in our, in our education system. Um, that data is on the record. And obviously we work with our local authority partners to ensure that the needs of young people with um, additional needs are fully met. Uh, I recently <coughs> set out the revised guidance on mainstreaming um, to ensure that appropriate decisions can be made um, in relation to the needs and the interests of individual young people, so that it's those considerations that are driving the decision about the educational placement of young people, and that is as it should be, that's how legislation envisages it to be the case, and obviously local authorities are required to make the necessary planning arrangements in terms of staffing arrangements to support such decisions. Question number two, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure there are appropriate levels of accommodation available for higher education students attending courses at campus. Shirley Ann Somerville. Universities are independent autonomous bodies and as such they have responsibility for their own staffing, admission, subject to provision, curriculum, research and student accommodation. The Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers are therefore unable to intervene in internal institutional matters such as student accommodation. However, as the member will be aware, the government is absolutely committed to the higher education sector in Scotland and invested over a billion pounds per year in the sector since 2012-13. That is why in 2018-19 we will deliver a real terms increase in Scottish Funding Council funding, demonstrating our sustained commitment to the achievement of excellence and equity in education. Lee MacArthur. I thank the Minister for her response. The growing success of Heriot Watts at campus in Stromness in my constituency has presented challenges in relation to student accommodation. I was contacted recently by a constituent who offers accommodation to eight of the university's students each year. Unlike larger accommodation providers, however, he doesn't qualify for an exemption from the new private residential tenancy agreements introduced under the 2016 Act. This means he can't guarantee students will leave after the term ends, so in turn can't offer accommodation to students for the next academic year, as he doesn't know that the rooms will be vacant. Does the Minister agree that this is not in the interest of students, the university or the wider uh, Orkney economy? And will she agree to consult with ministerial colleagues about how these provisions uh, might be island-proofed? Minister. Well, as the member will be fully aware, Harriet, what does rely very heavily um, on private landlords to provide the student accommodation in Orkney, they do have a dedicated staff resource to ensure every uh, student is accommodated. But as he knows, it is through uh, private landlords. I'm more than happy to take up the, the details of the, uh, the, the issue um, which Mr MacArthur has raised and discuss that with my ministers, particularly the Housing Minister. And Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I think it's clear that we've got a problem across Scotland. At Stirling University, 180 first-year students didn't have accommodation uh, last year. Under-18s cannot rent in the private sector. Care leavers and uh, international students struggle to find guarantors for private contracts. Disabled students very rarely find the appropriate private accommodation to meet their needs, and we see increasing rents on campuses as well. Will you commit to providing and researching the data on these issues and then convening a summit of university accommodation providers and student union representatives to actually tackle this problem, which is a lot wider? Minister. Well, as I said in my answer uh, to Liam MacArthur, the universities as autonomous institutions are responsible for student accommodation and it's not for me to interfere in the internal arrangements about how the um, how they deliver on um, um, the, the resource allocation that they give to student accommodation and how they um, dictate who um, becomes first in a, in a list for the provision that they have. I do recognise that there were some issues, for example, in Stirling University at the beginning of the last academic year, that was following a very uh, significant increase in demand for students 
priority was therefore given to students under 18 and those with prior previously known health considerations to deal with some of the issues um, that the member has raised. And autonomous bodies such as the universities uh, should deal sympathetically um, in every case when there is uh, um, a surplus um, demand um, that, that uh, they cannot accommodate within their own accommodation. And question number three, Andy Whiteman. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it provides for instrumental music education in primary and secondary schools. Cabinet Secretary. So, so the Scottish education system devolves decision making to local education authorities to make choices that meet their local circumstances and needs. The Scottish Government investment of £109 million since 2007 in the Youth Music Initiative has made a huge impact, <laughs> helping young people across the country access opportunities. Since 2012, we've provided £2.2 .2 million to Systema Scotland, a charity providing opportunities for young people to get involved in their big noise orchestras, which reaches 2,000 children weekly. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, answer. Instrumental music tuition, of course, is a discretionary service provided by local authorities. I've received representations about the future of the service in West Lothian, and the 2017 survey from the Improvement Service shows varying service across Scotland in relation to numbers of pupils and charging regime. And although the number of pupils has risen, charges have increased by 15% over the past two years, and the number of teachers is falling. Uh, I was surprised the Cabinet Secretary didn't make reference to the specialist music schools, which I look forward to meeting to him to talk about, because my understanding is that that is funding support uh, from the Scottish Government. But given the widely uh, known benefits of instrumental music, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what work is underway to review whether the recommendations of the Instrumental Music Group have been fully implemented? And will he consider the production of statutory guidance for the provision of instrumental music? services across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. There's a number of issues for me to respond to in, in that question, Presiding Officer. In relation to the music schools, um, the government took a decision in 2007 to essentially devolve funding for the music schools to individual local authorities, uh, but that was on the basis that we expected the maintenance and continuation of those music schools to be undertaken by those local authorities and not for the money to be devolved to local authorities and then used for another purpose. That would be wholly unacceptable. And I take this opportunity to reiterate the government's expectation in that respect. Um, on the question of instrumental musician, Mr Whiteman is correct that this is a discretionary service and that is the existing position. Uh, obviously, I'm able to give consideration to whether that should be made into statutory provision. Uh, and, I, and one of the factors that would weigh in that consideration would be the, the, the enormous benefits, which I recognise, to come to young people as a consequence of involvement in musical activity. And I've seen on many visits around the country the tremendous fulfilment that this brings to young people and the transformative change it can have in young people's lives. But the issue does get to the, rather to the heart of some of the issues that we wrestle with in Parliament on a regular basis, about how much discretion individual local authorities should have to operate services in a particular way that they consider to be appropriate in their locality. And uh, I know these are issues that Mr Whiteman um, is interested in. They're obviously issues the government um, seeks to take uh, considered and sensitive judgments about, um, but I'll certainly give consideration to the issue that Mr Whiteman has raised. Gordon Lindhurst. <coughs> Yes, on, on the point the Cabinet Secretary has just made, uh, with 22 out of 32 local authorities making some charge for instrumental music provision, is my understanding, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the playing field should be levelled to ensure access for all? And um, perhaps he might give a, a bit more detail on how that can be done. Cabinet Secretary. Well, well I, I think we, we come back to some of the issues I've just raised with Mr Whiteman. That I, I stand here and regularly face pressure from the opposition to allow local authorities to do things that they choose to want to do and not to interfere in what local authorities want to do. But then here Mr Linters now wants me to interfere in what local authorities are wanting to do. And in addition to wanting me to interfere in what local authorities are doing, Mr Linters, I presume, wants me to put more money into the system to level the playing field. Because in all of my experience, you don't... government generally doesn't level the playing field by any other means other than putting more money into the system. And of course the Conservatives persistently come here and tell us about how they want to reduce tax and reduce the money that's available for public expenditure. But then people at like Mr Linters come here and ask us to spend more money. 
Well, I have news for Mr Lindhurst. It is not possible to have it both ways. Polly McNeill. I'd like to press the Cabinet Secretary um, to tell me what importance the Scottish Government as a matter of policy attaches to children learning a musical instrument. Um, is the Scottish Government concerned that almost every council has increased charges for lessons and some have increased them up to £378? Um, notwithstanding what's, what he said in relation to local government, um, how can we protect the poorest families who have children who have an aptitude for music who might be excluded because of these policies? And does the Cabinet Secretary think there's any scope moving forward, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, you know, the powers of local authorities to decide, in working in partnership with local authorities to ensure um, that the poorest children in particular are not losing out in learning a musical instrument, which I think we do agree um, that it can be life enhancing for those children. As, as I said in my answer to Andy Whiteman, I reiterate happily to Polly McNeill, I see enormous benefits from young people being able to be involved in musical activity in schools. Um, it is a core part of the <laughs> curriculum. It is a core part of curriculum for excellence. <laughs> that is why every young person has the opportunity to participate in music through our curricular model. Um, and I do see that as transformative for some young people, particularly young people from deprived backgrounds where it may be um, a, a route into their wider learning, uh, which may not be possible because of uh, uh, other experience and obstacles that young people may face. So um, let me be crystal clear with Parliament that I think this is a beneficial um, approach. I think the fine question which I was trying to go through with uh, Mr Linters there and to an extent with Mr Whiteman is that the government is asked to respect the discretion of local authorities and not to interfere in the activities of local authorities. But I quite clearly understand from Polly McNeill's question the concern that she expresses about the fact that some local authorities may be charging um, what will be considered to be inappropriate levels of, uh, of, of, of charges for such, um, for such services. So there's a debate to be had there about what's the correct balance. The government's very happy to work in partnership uh, on all of these questions, uh, but we have to take into account the fact that local authorities may wish to undertake different approaches in different ways. Um, but what I would encourage is a focus on uh, taking forward that activity in a fashion that enables young people, regardless of their background, to participate in this activity. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to encourage qualified teachers who have left the profession to return. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, we have supported our teacher education universities to develop new routes into teaching, and included in these routes is a return to teaching course which was brought forward by the University of Edinburgh. The university has developed their return to teaching course to create a new and national online course that helps prepare qualified teachers who have been out of teaching for a while uh, or those who have never taught in Scotland for the classroom. There were 31 students in the first cohort of the course which started in October 2017 and there are 23 in the second cohort which began in January of this year. The course brings participants up to speed with the latest education policy requirements as well as pedagogy and other educational issues. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. All teachers in Scotland are on the same pay scale and the subject taught is not a consideration on the level of pay received. There are no circumstances where a school or local authority can offer a different pay arrangement based on the subject taught and this can mitigate against uh, attracting teachers back into the profession who may have retired early. Given that the workload of teachers varies considerably according to subject, for example teachers of English have to read and mark dozens of essays most weeks, would recognition of that difference through better pay not help reduce the shortage of teachers in key subjects? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I understand the point that Mr Gibson is making, but uh, in my experience, regardless of the subject discipline in which teachers are, um, are active, they are all hardworking and dedicated professionals who will have very significant workload to deliver. Teachers' pay is determined by the Scottish Negotiating Committee for Teachers, the SNCT provides flexibility where a council may increase the salary of a teacher if in the particular circumstances of the post it considers the salary to be inadequate. The recent SNCT pay deal commits all three sides to undertake a strategic review of pay and reward for the 2018 pay settlement. Liz Smith. Uh, 
But Secretary, according to Scottish Government statistics, there's a growing pool of retired staff currently who might be willing to return to the classroom for short periods to help cover some of the gaps. Indeed, I have a constituent myself uh, who's um, willing to return to the uh, classroom, but he's making the point that if he goes on the supply roll, it could have detrimental effects on his pension. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary, is he minded under the jurisdiction of Holyrood rules whether there, anything can be done to mitigate that disincentive? Cabinet Secretary. I think there is a, there is, um, there is a, a, a difficulty and an issue in the circumstances that Liz Smith uh, puts to me. And indeed, I was just looking at a particular case that had been drawn to my attention by Gail Ross. Um, a, a constituent of Gail Ross's had made a representation which I suspect is pretty similar to the one that Liz Smith has had. Um, as Liz Smith will know, there is a very complicated interaction in the pension rules between the areas of responsibility which we can exercise discretion over and the areas of discretion that um, are reserved to the United Kingdom government but also set out in legislation over which I have no control. Now, what I'm not going to say today is that it's that I've completed my analysis of the interaction of those issues. Um, indeed, I just this morning um, asked for some further work to be done before I reply to uh, Gail Ross on her case um, to test some of the issues which may be possible to be developed. So I think that, that there is an impediment here, which I acknowledge, where there is an interaction between the supply pay and a uh, pension arrangements. Um, but I'm not certain at this stage if it is all within our control to resolve that. And even if we went to the United Kingdom government, I'm not saying it might not be conceivable for an agreement to be reached. But uh, I've not quite completed my analysis of that point. I will take this opportunity, however, to say that in the SNCT pay deal, which was um, agreed just before Christmas, there are revisions to the supply uh, pay and conditions which I do hope encourages more individuals to see supply as a meaningful contribution they can make to meeting the staffing challenges that we face. And Ian Gray. Uh, I can only agree with the Cabinet Secretary's response to Mr Gibson's supplementary question, but uh, it is the case that one thing which would help bring teachers back uh, into the classroom would be a restorative pay rise for all teachers to make the profession attractive again. The Cabinet Secretary referred to a strategic review of teachers' pay. Can you tell us what the parameters of that review will be? Cabinet Secretary. The, the parameters will be uh, set by the SNCT, which, as Mr Gray will know, is a tripartite body involving the trade unions and professional associations, I should say, uh, local authorities and the government. Uh, the, as part of the pay settlement for 2017-18, uh, uh, the SNCT agreed to undertake uh, this strategic review. The government will participate within that review fully and obviously the conclusions of that will be, uh, I suspect, material to the resolution of the um, pay awards for 2018 and subsequent years, uh, which will be the subject of further consideration. Question number five, Fulton McGregor. To ask the Scottish Government how many local authorities pay the minimum level for school clothing grants. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, we know that the school clothing grant is essential for many families and local authorities have a duty to make provision for the purpose of ensuring sufficient and suitable clothing of pupils. We are taking a, right, a, a range of actions to ensure that the cost is not a barrier to learning. Uh, we already provide free school meals to all primary one and primary three children and all children in primary four and beyond who are eligible through qualifying benefits. Through the Scottish Attainment Challenge, we are working with local authorities to explore further support for schools on removing costs and overcoming barriers. Fulton McGregor. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. In my constituency, with enormous backing from the public, volunteers have launched the Cool School Uniform Service and they can provide uniforms for those children in need. Only weeks in and they've already received around 200 referrals and counting from schools and other agencies. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that council should be paying the minimum level and does he think that the Fair of Scotland duty that will come into force in 2018 will make local authorities think about this important issue and help eliminate the need for uniform banks altogether? Cabinet Secretary. First of all, President Officer, can I pay tribute to the work of the school, the Cool School Uniform Initiative and uh, which has been run by the Hope to Help Voluntary Group in North Lanarkshire and commend those individuals on the work that they are um, undertaking. 
the, the, there is discussions to be had between the government and local authorities about school clothing grants. Um, some of those discussions um, were started some time ago and uh, I will continue those discussions. Um, Mr McGregor is correct that the Fair of Scotland duty, which comes into effect this April, will require public bodies, including the government, local authorities and the NHS, to consider what more we can all do to reduce poverty and inequality when making decisions. Um, I've set out a range of measures that the government takes forward and obviously um, as part of our discussions with local authorities around um, school clothing grants, uh, we will uh, aim to consider these issues uh, alongside the Fairer Scotland duty to which we will be obliged to act. Question number six, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage more young people into apprenticeships. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. Uh, the Scottish Government and our partners undertake a wide range of activity to encourage the uptake of our apprenticeship offer with a focus on young people through our developing the young workforce activity. We promote apprenticeship opportunities to school students and we continue to support Scottish Apprenticeship Week, our national campaign showcasing the benefits of apprenticeships to young people and employers. In addition, Skills Development Scotland actively promotes apprenticeships through a range of channels on an ongoing basis, such as their website, apprenticeships.scot. And we continue to offer more opportunities. Last week, I announced to Parliament the next year we will grow the number of foundation apprenticeship starts to over 2,500 from around 1,200 this year and will provide 28,000 modern apprenticeship opportunities up from 27,000 starts this year. Of those 28,000 starts, around 900 will be graduate level apprenticeships up from 370 this year. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Minister for that response. Despite the various measures outlined by the Minister, the SNP's record on modern apprenticeships continues to be poor. In 2016-17, there was a decline in the number of starts for modern apprenticeships for 16 to 24 year olds and for young people entering STEM framework modern apprenticeships. Can the Minister please explain why after 10 years of SNP government, the level of apprenticeships for young people in Scotland continues to trail significantly behind the rest of the UK? Minister. Well, let, let me say I find that uh, quite frankly an extraordinary question from uh, Mr Lockhart. In the uh, last full year, which we have figures available, we had 26,262 modern apprenticeship starts and an increase from 25,818 on uh, the year before, showing a positive uh, trajectory. If you look over uh, the last decade or so, there's been a considerable increase in the number of modern apprenticeship opportunities across all age ranges. And this question is uh, extraordinary further still, uh, President Officer, when you consider that since we've seen the uh, morass of the apprenticeship levy, a UK government uh, initiated, that just today, in fact, uh, clearly uh, Mr Lockhart wasn't paying attention on the BBC, uh, Neil Carberry, uh, the CBI Managing Director has said of the Tory apprenticeship levy, it's the latest example of a policy that's not yet right. It's been subject to criticism in the Daily Telegraph, not an organ of the press. I normally read the presiding officer on the 7th of January. Uh, John Timpson, the chairman of, of Timpson, said the levy is nothing but a tax criticising the process of drawing down funding in England. And it, what really staggers me, of course, presiding officer, is that the first quarter after the introduction of the levy in England, under Tory jurisdiction, we saw a 59.3% fall in the number of apprenticeship starts from the equivalent period in the year before. 48,000 starts down from 117,800. When you look at the first quarter since the introduction of the levy here in Scotland, obviously we see the figures remaining steady and after quarter two of this year, we're well on track to meet our target. Question seven, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on widening access to university, particularly for those from the most disadvantaged areas. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. This Scottish Government's um, ambition is that every child, no matter their background, has an equal chance of going into higher education. That is why we established a Commission on Widening Access and have set clear targets for universities to help achieve this goal. <coughs> We've appointed a Commissioner for Fair Access, introduced a full bursary for young care experienced students and have established an access delivery group to drive forward progress. Between, 16 and 17, uh, between 2016 and 2017, we saw an 11% increase in the number of 18-year-olds from the most deprived communities in Scotland being accepted to study at university. This takes the number to a record high, and we must maintain this momentum. That is why I've asked universities to increase the pace for delivery for key recommendations, <coughs> such as the introduction of access thresholds and a guaranteed offer of a place for care-experienced students who meet entry requirements. David Jones. 
thank the Minister for that response. Can the Minister outline the Government's response to the Commissioner for Fair Access first annual report and also what the Government are doing to encourage universities to increase the number of students admitted directly from colleges, which could help? Minister. Well, I very much welcome the Commissioner's uh, first annual report, which builds on the recommendations from the Commission on Widening Access. I'll be discussing the report with key stakeholders at the next Access Delivery Group and will respond to the recommendations in due course. Our colleges do play a key role in access to higher education and that's why we continue to invest £51 million a year to support approximately 7,000 places for access students and those progressing from college. We accepted the recommendation made by the Commission on Widening Access that the Scottish Funding Council should seek more demanding articulation targets from some universities and I strongly support the Commissioner's call for universities to substantially increase the number of HND and HNC students entering university. This is something the government is strongly committed uh, to delivering on, but we cannot do so alone, nor can the Funding Council. As autonomous institutions, we need the colleges and universities to do similar. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's all very well and good asking institutions to do more. However, I wondered if the Minister could tell us what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that our schools are in a position to offer pupils the subjects they require for their particular university admission when it comes to entry requirements for specialist institutions like the Royal Conservatoire, Glasgow School of Art and Scotland's Rural College. Minister. Well, the Scottish Government takes very seriously our um, requirement to ensure that we are delivering um, in the senior phase of the education system. That's why we are currently um, undertaking a review of the learner journey um, from 15 to 24 to ensure that every young person um, has the choices in front of them that they want to, to make, whether that's going into a job, uh, an apprenticeship, college or indeed university. And as that work continues with the development of the learner journey, I'm sure we can pick up points that the member has made today. Question eight, James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports distance learning for postgraduate students. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. As I announced on the 5th of January from academic year 2018 19, students undertaking eligible postgraduate distance learning courses will be able to access a tuition fee loan of £5,500. In addition to this, full time students will also be able to access a living cost loan of £4,500. This builds on the expansion of the support package for eligible students on taught postgraduate courses put in place for their academic year 2017-18. That change has helped contribute to an increase in the number of applications for support for full-time students in 2017-18, and it forms part of our wider package, which last year provided £834.6 million pound in support of 100. 143,110 um, full-time students in Scotland. James Dornan. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, I was pleased to see the 5% increase in the number of Scottish postgrad students studying at Scottish higher education institutions. However, despite this increase in Scottish students, does the Minister share my concern at the potential impact that Brexit will have on the number of EU students coming to study in Scotland's excellent institutions on postgrad courses? Yes, sir. I do absolutely share his concern. This government recognises the enormous benefits that EU students bring to this country, enriching our culture, our communities and contributing to our economy, both at an undergraduate and postgraduate level. That's why I'm pleased to reaffirm our commitment that eligible EU students considering applying for postgraduate courses in Scotland for academic year 2018-19 will continue to be eligible for tuition fee support at the same level as Scottish students. We will also continue to work with universities and students to discuss the impacts of Brexit and how we can all ensure that Scotland's universities remain attractive, competitive and diverse. Question number nine, Marie Goujon. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to improve teacher recruitment. Cabinet Secretary. So, so the Government is taking a range of actions to help increase the number of teachers, including committing £88 million this year to make sure every school has access to the right number of teachers with the right skills investing over £100 million through the Scottish Attainment Challenge to support universities in developing new innovative routes into teaching and launching the second phase of our Teaching Makes People recruitment campaign. This action has halted a period of steady decline in teacher recruitment, resulting in almost 800 more teachers than there were two years ago. 
Managusha. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I've been contacted by some of my constituents regarding specialist teachers uh, needed not only in STEM subjects, but in subjects such as music and art. What is the Scottish, Scottish Government doing to attract high quality individuals from other professions to increase teacher numbers in these areas? Cabinet Secretary. In my earlier answer, I referred to the new routes into teaching and as part of that we've worked very closely with the Royal Conservatoire for Scotland on their new music teaching degree and as I referred to in one of my earlier answers we've also supported the University of Edinburgh with their new National Return to Teach course which is open to teachers of all subjects including art and music and obviously we take forward a regular dialogue indeed I just had this discussion last week with the uh, the, the, the Council of Deans of Education uh, about the appropriate recruitment and the balance of recruitment of teachers to ensure that we have the, um, the appropriate number of teachers with the right specialisms in our schools uh, to deliver the curriculum for young people in Scotland. Question 10, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to address the reported high pupil teacher ratios across the Lovian area. Cabinet Secretary. Um, the government is investing £88 million this year so that every school has access to the appropriate number of teachers. Our investment has enabled councils to improve the overall te pupil-teacher ratio nationally and halted a steady decline in the number of teachers. Um, the numbers of teachers increased by 253 in 2016 and then by 543 teachers last year. I'm pleased that the local authorities in the Lothians have either maintained or improved their overall teacher numbers and pupil ratios. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? You'll be aware, aware that over the last several years, poor teacher recruitment and retention rates have led to a rise for pupil teacher ratios in schools. In the Edinburgh Council area alone, there's been a rise from an average of 4.2 in 2012 to 15.1 now making it one of the highest ratios in Scotland. Given the Scottish Government's stated aim to reach the pupil ratio of 13.7, when, when does it expect this to be reached in the Lothian area? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the agreement that we've reached with local government is around a national figure on the pupil-teacher ratio, and that has improved to 13.6. So that has been met around the country, and obviously, the increase in teacher numbers, as I indicated in my original answer, of 253 followed by 543 has significantly assisted that position. Um, I, I note in the Lothian area that there has been a decline in the pupil-teacher ratio, or actually so a reduction in the pupil-teacher ratio, a beneficial um, a, to the pupil-teacher ratio in East Lothian, and a static position in the city of Edinburgh, Mid Lothian and West Lothian. But obviously, the um, recruitment of teachers assists in this approach and the government's budget uh, supports this measure by ensuring that there is not only a strong settlement for local government, but there's also the investment of funds um, through the Pupil Equity Fund and the Scottish Attainment Challenge that assists in the recruitment of teachers. And question 11, Alex Cole Hamilton. Do you ask the Scottish Government what its position is on gender neutral school uniforms? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, local authorities and individual schools are responsible for setting their own school uniform policies and rules, taking into account local needs and circumstances. The Scottish Government is clear that all young people should be treated equally and schools should ensure that suitable school clothing is worn. Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will join me in paying tribute to Jess Insull, a 15-year-old who has successfully brought a motion through the Liberal Democrat conference endorsing gender-neutral school uniform and has rightly received a great deal of media attention for her efforts. As she said at our conference, it's not about dictating the way anyone dresses. All it really means is not treating people differently because of their gender. Now, I welcome indication from the ministers over Christmas that boys and girls should be treated equally, but equalities cannot be left to regional variation. So can the minister tell me whether the Scottish Government will take steps to require schools to provide inclusive, non-prescriptive, gender-neutral school uniform policies, and will it provide support and advice to schools adapting or changing their policies to make them more inclusive? Cabinet Secretary, could you make your answer shorter than the question, if possible, please? <laughs> well, I, 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 could certainly, I could certainly try to say, I think, the first thing I want to say is that 
Mr. Cole Hamilton, and I just would respectfully ask him to reflect on what he's put to me. He's asked me at central level yeah. to regulate and dictate yeah. to schools and local authorities. When, when Mr. Cole Hamilton regularly comes here and complains about the government allegedly dictating to and instructing local authorities. So I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll share the, 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 the comments I was making to Mr. Lindhurst. It must be a Lothian condition that's leading to this. Uh, I'll share my comments with Mr. Lindhurst, with Mr. Cole Hamilton. Um, the government, there is no centrally issued guidance, but the government is clear that young people should be treated equally, and it's up to individual schools and local authorities to take those decisions. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions. We'll move on to the next item of business, which is uh, Labour business. Uh, we'll just take a few moments for members to, and ministers to change seats.